kind of already uh, dispensed with the personal introductions, um, but uh, yeah, in terms of the topic for the hour, uh, we'll be talking about tools for implementing shared stewardship. Uh, that's a pretty broad term. Uh, we'll kind of dig into what exactly uh, the agency seems to mean when they say shared stewardship. Um, and Emory, if you want to, you can bounce to the next slide. Uh, so we really want to uh, yeah, go over shared stewardship as a concept, uh, what it means for entities that are looking to partner, uh, and then we'll also dig into specifics on tools and authorities and programs that can be used for, we'll say more generically, cross-boundary partnership. Uh, and some of this presentation started uh, when folks from FactNet reached out to us to talk about good neighbor authority specifically. Uh, so we will have a big chunk on that, uh, but we'll also cover uh, other tools and authorities. And I think we'll, we'll talk, um, hopefully we'll touch on a number of different things and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion at the end too. And next slide. So for folks who aren't familiar with RBCC, Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition, uh, just a little bit of an introduction. So uh, we're a small nonprofit. We work at the intersection of ecosystem restoration and rural community well-being. Uh, generally, what that means is that we're trying to promote and advance uh, collaborative, scientifically informed all lands restoration projects. Uh, and that is often through the use of federal tools and authorities. Uh, so our work kind of uh, proceeds in, in three main directions. Uh, we work with peer learning, so that might be organizing workshops, not unlike this one. Uh, we also have peer exchanges where we bring people from one geography to a different geography to see how partners in a, in a different place are working with tools and authorities. Uh, we also create learning products. Uh, so those are essentially research documents like some of those that you see on the screen here. Uh, and I believe uh, our tech folks will drop some links as we go along to some of these uh, and, and generally just go to our website, check them out if you wanna follow up on any of them. We will kind of touch on some of these uh, conversationally. And, and so if you have additional questions or you wanna dig into details, I encourage you to take a look at uh, some of the publications. Uh, and then lastly, we also work uh, doing policy analysis uh, and a certain degree of advocacy as well. Uh, although there's, there's quite a bit of wiggle room in there. Um, so from a, I guess, a practitioner standpoint, that often means tracking, uh, developing policies, uh, new policies, and helping folks understand how they work and how they can access it. All right, next slide. So for this presentation, uh, I already touched on some of this, but uh, kind of the run of, run of show here, uh, after um, finished with this introduction, we'll do, we'll pause briefly uh, and have some audience polling. So that's, that's for all of you. Uh, to give Emory and I a better sense of your familiarity with some of the things that we want to touch on and uh, the geographies you work in uh, and a few other things. And so hopefully we'll be able to kind of tailor on the fly to, uh, to meet the, uh, the needs and awareness level of all of you. Uh, then I'll launch into an overview of shared stewardship, talking about what it is, what it isn't, and what direction it might go in under a new administration. Uh, and I'll also start to kick off uh, Good Neighbor Authority, talking about some of the history, background, uh, general uses and managing finances, and then Emory will pick up uh, and talk about it more um, from the research that we've done, so how it's actually rolling out on the ground, uh, and talk about it in context relative to other pathways of accomplishing work. Uh, and then Emory will also touch on other tools and authorities for cross-boundary partnership. Uh, and then after a short conclusion, we should have plenty of time for uh, Q&A and even really discussion. Uh, so I'm sure all of you are seeing a lot of things that we'll touch on in your geographies. And so I think Emory and I are also curious to hear what, what you're seeing and how you're feeling about things. And next slide. All right, so I think we're gonna pause for the audience polling. Yep, Ooh. I'm gonna stop my share Tyson and hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the uh, feedback on the polls. Uh, I, I feel like we have pitched this to roughly kind of the right direction, sort of a mid-level understanding of shared stewardship and good neighbor. And I uh, also appreciate that there's uh, some, I think, um, I guess sort of a, a lukewarm response to, uh, to shared stewardship in particular. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll launch into some of that. Um, so my hope is to just go over a little bit of the uh, background and really kind of context and impl implications and future direction of shared stewardship. Uh, I should say, obviously, I'm not in the agency. Uh, no, oh, you can go ahead for the next one, that's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, not speaking on behalf of the agency, really offering an outsider perspective on it, uh, which I hope has uh, some use in the sense that um, I'm, I'm not bound by talking points about how great it is. Um, so really, uh, what is it and where did it start? Uh, if folks recall back to August 2018, 
uh, the Forest Service put out a document uh, sh towards shared stewardship across landscapes and outcome-based investment strategy. Uh, and the rollout of that was really a, a very political exercise. Uh, so you had uh, Sonny Perdue, uh, Secretary of Agriculture at the time, uh, presenting with a number of senators about this project. Uh, and really, I would argue that it was something of a political response to the fire funding folks. Uh, so the agency and, and the administration uh, felt that they needed to demonstrate a pathway forward to accomplishing restoration work and doing fire risk reduction. Uh, and this was kind of the, the documents and the term and the rallying cry to get behind. Uh, arguably, if you look back to that document that now feels a million years old, uh, it really highlights the, the term investment strategy. Uh, and so I, I think part of this at the time was also a desire to get states to really begin to partner uh, with the Forest Service and begin to bring some of their own resources to the table, which had already started to happen in states like uh, California and Oregon, probably others as well that I'm less familiar with. Uh, but this was really a call to, uh, you know, sort of all hands, all lands, uh, get everybody into it. Over time, the agency started to identify shared stewardship as uh, basically three values. So the desire to work at scale, uh, to do cross-boundary work, and to engage in joint priority setting. Uh, and that last point, uh, I would say they were sort of uh, a little silent on who they were jointly setting priorities with, uh, but definitely the whole thing had a, a strong state focus. Next slide. So what is it really, right? I mean, it's fine to say that it was a politi political exercise uh, and to, to talk about this document and, and the values within it, uh, but really what did it mean for the agency? Uh, and I would, I would say that it seemed like it was sort of the new mantra of the agency uh, as pace and scale had been before. Uh, it was a new administration branding uh, much of the same work in, in a slightly different way. Uh, and for the Washington office, it really seemed to lead to a drive to sign state and federal MOUs, Memoranda of Understanding. Uh, it's worth noting that those MOUs, despite being something that the agency started to count and report out as being sort of signs of success and shared stewardship, uh, they're pretty much legally non-binding documents. They don't really uh, institutionalize any working relationship. They're really more of a statement of values between the partners that are, are coming to the table. Um, and RBCC did put together a bit of a summary, a crosswalk of the agreements up to the time. Uh, that's, uh, we're, we're not entirely up to date on that, but we will continue to work on that. Uh, but the themes that emerged from it uh, were variable, uh, but there were some really core consistent uh, aspects. Fire risk reduction being pretty much number one. Uh, forest management uh, generally was also an um, emergent theme uh, between those MOUs, uh, response to insects and disease outbreaks, uh, an emphasis on partnerships, and then uh, to a lesser extent, an emphasis on, on uh, improving local economies. Uh, so those were sort of the, the flavors that we were starting to see emerge, but they are incredibly variable state to state. And so some states included things like recreation, others were much more laser beam focused on fire risk reduction. Uh, so pretty, um, yeah, pretty variable. Uh, and that contrasts a little bit with what I generally heard when I talked to folks that were working at a field level. So in districts and forests, and, and I imagine some of you probably heard the same thing, generally field staff would say shared stewardship is business as usual. It's something they're already doing, uh, especially in region six where there's a long history of partnership. Uh, generally, uh, people seem to feel that this was a, a bit of a change in political winds, uh, but really a continuation of of much of the same kind of work uh, in partnership for both planning and implementation that they had been doing. Next slide. So what shared stewardship isn't uh, is maybe a little easier to talk about. Uh, and this is something that I, I continue to um, hear some confusion on. So uh, apologies if this is already obvious to you, but uh, it's not new funding, right? So it, it is, a, I guess, in theory, a bit of a change in direction in terms of strategy. Uh, but it really isn't a new investment, at least not from the federal perspective. Um, I say that, but there's a little bit of a caveat. There was a little bit of internal uh, jostling of couch cushion money that they did put towards projects, uh, but that process was largely black box. It happened within the agency. They didn't consult external partners, uh, and it wasn't really so much money uh, that it signaled a, a massive shift in direction. Uh, so again, back to this concept of a desire for state investment, uh, it seems like the real origin of it was uh, wanting states to be bringing additional resources, not for the federal government to pony up new money to accomplish uh, new and different priorities as set by state and federal partners. Uh, it's also not a new program or authority in a legal sense. 
Uh, so again, a, a confusion that I hear pretty frequently is that uh, partners uh, might be signing shared stewardship agreements, right? Uh, shared stewardship doesn't really, uh, or it doesn't, um, it doesn't operationalize any of those more local relationships. Uh, there are other tools, and we'll get into some of those, and it seems like most folks on, the, on this meeting are pretty familiar with those, uh, but shared stewardship itself doesn't really offer a new pathway uh, like a, you know, in, in comparison to good neighbor or a cost share agreement or anything like that. Next slide. So shared stewardship implications on the ground, I mean, I, I think this is where, for most of us, we probably care the most, right? Uh, political terms will come and go. Uh, but what actually came out of shared stewardship? Uh, I, I would point to a couple of things as really concrete examples of, uh, of changes that happened, um, although both of them are, are tied to efforts that would have happened no matter what. Uh, so one is updating forest action plans and the other is good neighbor. Um, starting with forest action plans for, for those who have worked with uh, state forestry agencies who probably are familiar with this, uh, but uh, there was a requirement set in Farm Bill uh, that those be updated in 2020. Uh, and in theory, at least, they help direct funding of state and private forestry money uh, to different priorities in, in each state. Uh, so, good neighbor, or I'm sorry, shared stewardship did become really tied in with the updating of forest action plans, but again, pretty variable state to state. Uh, Washington State leaned really heavily on that. Other states seem to do a, a fairly closed door process in their updates. Uh, but at least uh, in theory, that's a place that a state could begin to influence uh, federal expenditures. Uh, the second place where I think we really saw on the ground changes uh, is through the uh, pretty rapid adoption of good neighbor authority. Uh, GNA existed before the concept of shared stewardship, uh, and it will probably <laughs> continue long after the concept of shared stewardship or the term shared stewardship. Uh, but this is a lot, it, it, Good Neighbor is, is really a lot of what provides the sort of engine within shared stewardship. So I talked to field folks uh, around the country that would often point to GNA as the place that those state federal partnerships became actually operationalized uh, in a way that the MOUs could, could never really do. Uh, and so I, I think as a result of that, uh, we have certainly seen a greater state and federal uh, communication uh, at an agency level. So I think field staff are getting a better sense of the work of, um, of other agencies and, and beginning in some places to integrate work more um, and really just sort of communicate generally. And next slide. So a few further implications of what shared stewardship led to, and this is more at a national or Washington office scale. Uh, I think that what we saw was a tilt uh, in the direction of partnerships. So, you know, the term partnership is, or the support for partnership is something that's pretty consistent uh, from administration to administration. Uh, but shared stewardship did represent a bit of a tilt in the direction of state federal partnerships, I think to the exclusion of partnerships uh, with more local scale um, implementation and planning partners. Um, and hopefully that's something we can, we can get into in discussion. Uh, it also coupled with flagship targets. So this was the last administration's um, change to basically focus on timber volume and acres treated. Uh, coupled with those, those two things, it, we saw a real shift in emphasis uh, towards implementation and away from collaborative planning. Uh, so that represented a change from the Obama era where there was a strong emphasis on local collaboration as sort of a planning mechanism. Uh, what I saw in the last three-ish years uh, was the agency really uh, desiring implementation partners, uh, which obviously provides new opportunities, but also seemed to um, result in a bit of a, a cooling down on the relationship on a planning side. And next slide. So, you know, it, at this point, it almost seems silly to spend a lot of time talking about shared stewardship and that it is something that uh, came out of the last administration. I think we're likely to see changes in the new administration, uh, but I think it, it's worth thinking through uh, what some of those, those shifts might be. Um, I mentioned this before, but the trend towards partnership, I don't think is likely to change. Uh, I think everyone I've talked to both within the new administration and within agency leadership is really clear that partnership is the way that they do their work now. Uh, but I think that we may see, as, as I was touching on earlier, a shift in the balance of what partners are considered uh, and I, I imagine that with the incoming administration, uh, so many of, of the folks in it uh, were in the Obama administration. I think we will see more of a tipping back towards local collaboration and collaborative planning um, and maybe less uh, towards states themselves. 
Uh, so again, related to that, I think we'll see a declining shift uh, in emphasis from states. And, and part of that is because insofar as shared stewardship is an investment strategy, truly, uh, we've just seen a real hit to state budgets uh, as a result of COVID. So I, I don't think that states are going to be able to bring the same kind of resources uh, to the table, with some exceptions, California being uh, definitely the most notable. Uh, and then I, the last point here I, I offer, I, I hope we can come back to in Q&A and discussion, uh, but I think that shared stewardship in a lot of ways for the agency just became the way that they had to brand any broader change efforts. So alterations to the business model uh, and other strategic directions. And, and I think that's a, a, a growing list of things. And so in some ways, uh, maybe we, we are seeing a real opportunity for change in the agency, whatever you may call it. Uh, and that includes Fire Plan 2.0 is, is what I've been hearing folks refer to it internally. So this is a sort of spatial prioritization of work. Uh, and then also new business models. So things like budget modernization, uh, and uh, review of personnel structures, uh, which is something that my understanding is the agency does want to get into, uh, as well as performance measures more generally. So I, I mentioned flagship targets. I think there's been a lot of work under the shared stewardship banner uh, to start to look at uh, ways to measure partnership as well. And, and so I uh, imagine that we'll continue to see some of that work progress. Next slide. So pause for a moment and shift gears. Um, I want to talk about Good Neighbor. As I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to spend a lot of time on Good Neighbor in part because that was sort of um, what Annie had originally encouraged us to talk about. Uh, it sounds like there's some curiosity about the functioning of the authority. And then also within the context of shared stewardship, as I mentioned before, it's kind of the, uh, the engine within it. It's the, it's the place where the work actually happens. Uh, and next slide. So why listen to Emory and I at all on this topic? I'll provide a little bit of background on, on our work with uh, Good Neighbor. Um, so I personally have worked in Oregon Department of Forestry. Uh, Boone, good to see you, you uh, have changed hats. Uh, so I have worked with Good Neighbor directly, uh, set up agreements in Central and Eastern Oregon, uh, and worked mostly with, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into these details, but uh, service agreements, so essentially doing fuels reduction work, uh, not uh, timber work. Um, so that might be of more interest to folks that are really focused on uh, fire risk reduction. Uh, we also authored a 2018 report, Understanding Good Neighbor. You can find that on our website. Uh, and we are in the process of updating it. So Emory and I have been working on that. Um, all of that was made possible through funding through the U.S. Forest Service, both state and private forestry, and then also Region 6. Uh, we've conducted uh, more in-depth interviews in, in Region 6. Uh, all flags a limitation, especially given the geography of folks um, that are joining. It is definitely focused on the Western US. Um, and so if, if we do want to get into other examples or its, its uses and potential uses in other regions, happy to see what we can do. But uh, we'll admit that uh, the, the bench is deeper for the Western US. Um, but yeah, be curious to hear what's going on in other places too. And next slide. So. What is Good Neighbor? Uh, you know, it's a federal authority. Uh, in short, it allows the Forest Service or BLM uh, to work in partnership with states, tribes, and counties uh, to conduct restoration across forests, watersheds, and rangelands. Um, it has a long history. Uh, it started as a pilot in Colorado in 2001, uh, and it continued for years, but didn't really seem to get much traction. Uh, it wasn't until the 2014 Farm Bill that we saw a national rollout of Good Neighbor. Uh, and some really critical differences and changes, including the ability for states to manage timber sales directly for the Forest Service. Uh, and that seems to have been a, one of the big incentives to, uh, to get more states to begin engaging. Uh, we also saw changes in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, including an expansion of partnerships to tribes and counties and clarification on uh, roads work and uh, the management of revenue. And so we'll, we'll get into all that. Uh, part of the reason that I mentioned this legislative history is just to, to say, GNA is still an evolving authority, and I expect that we will continue to see legislative changes to it. So, um, you know, kind of uh, note the timestamp of any information that you get on Good Neighbor. Uh, it does change, and, and even our guidebook from 2018 uh, is still using and discussing the um, revenue model uh, from before the 2018 Farm Bill. Next slide. So, high level, the purpose of the authority is to improve coordination across federal, state, and private boundaries. Uh, so it, it was originally conceived of as an all lands tool or a cross boundary tool. 
Uh, it also desired to increase capacity to accomplish restoration. So by bringing state agencies in, the idea was you could boost the capacity to do this work. Uh, and then already touched on, but uh, the original flavor of it and original intent uh, seems to have been uh, cross boundary restoration. So potentially finding efficiencies in, in doing things across the line where a state agency might be working. And uh, so just bundle all of that kind of project together. Next slide. I, I mentioned high level, the, the types of projects that are allowed under Good Neighbor are forest, watershed, and rangeland restoration. Uh, and emphasis on the restoration, it, were it not for the restoration component, in theory, you're not supposed to be doing a project. Uh, but what that's meant really in terms of the projects that we're seeing on the ground or the sort of, uh, I'll say, universe of potential projects, and Emory will talk more about uh, what kinds of projects we're seeing most. Uh, it includes habitat improvement, fuels management, insect and disease control, project planning, project preparation work. Uh, so um, uh, boundary marking or uh, assistance to the NEPA process, uh, road repair or decommissioning, and really importantly, commercial timber removal. Next slide. Uh, there are a handful of impermissible activities, at least as currently uh, interpreted by the Forest Service. And, and I should have said this up front. Another limitation is that um, most of this research, most of what I'm referring to is Forest Service focused. Uh, BLM does have these authorities, but uh, they simply haven't adopted it in the same way, at least in the West. Uh, so I'm, I'm mostly talking Forest Service here. Uh, but things that the Forest Service has decided that you can't really use this tool for are um, any sort of shared facilities costs or equipment costs. Uh, generally can't use it for recreation, although there have been examples, and, and I would say much like stewardship contracting, if you sort of you know, twist the lens a little bit, you could say that it's um, stream restoration for, for some work. Uh, and generally not used for prescribed fire. Uh, there are a couple of states that have started to get into that, uh, but uh, I, what I have heard from grants and agreement staff within the Forest Service uh, is that they tend to point towards other existing uh, agreement mechanisms to, um, to handle liability, uh, and so have shied away from utilizing good neighbors as, as uh, the real prescribed fire route. I uh, can't, also can't do new road construction, uh, and then um, can't just hire employees that have a, a shared position. So uh, in some ways, functionally, we have already seen some of that, but in terms of the way that the agency describes it, technically shouldn't be doing it. So you can't just um, have a generic position. It has to be project focused. Uh, next slide. So noteworthy aspects of Good Neighbor, uh, and again, Emory will, will touch on some of these details as well, but the retention of timber revenue for additional restoration work is a, a huge incentive to the adoption of this authority uh, in those locations, at least where, where timber actually has some value. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll get into the management of revenue on the next slide, uh, but that is a, a really um, unique aspect of this. Uh, so it sets it quite a ways apart from most uh, cooperative agreements that nonprofit partners might be able to enter into. And, and also really uh, is pretty different even from stewardship agreements and contracting, uh, which also keep some of the uh, retained receipts and is the terminology in that case. Uh, but uh, it, with Good Neighbor, it, it is a, a potential for a state to, to simply manage the entire timber sale, so pretty unique. Uh, it also requires a really close working relationship between state and federal agencies, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, so I think what we saw from 2014 through probably 2018 and, and in still ongoing in many states is just a bit of a getting to know you period uh, between state and federal agencies as they uh, learn each other's processes and procedures um, and uh, try to hash out whether they have a level of trust and communication to actually utilize the authority. Uh, it's also worth flagging that uh, NEPA remains in federal hands. So even if a state or a tribe or a county engages in planning assistance, uh, they don't uh, have decision-making authority under NEPA that, that rests with the Forest Service or BLM still. Uh, and then a further uh, aspect that's worth noting is this inclusion of tribes and counties. Um, we'll uh, talk about this a little more as we talk about GNA in context of other pathways of accomplishing work, uh, but that does uh, create more opportunities uh, or potential opportunities uh, for new partners to be engaged in, in boosting capacity. And next slide. So wanted to touch on this. This may be something that some folks have, have heard, uh, others perhaps not. But uh, as I mentioned, one of the original intentions of Good Neighbor is that it would be a cross-boundary tool. Uh, and so a, a certain amount of uh, 
examination has been placed on uh, the concept of adjacency versus similar and complementary. Uh, and I won't get into too much of the legislative history here, but um, suffice to say, for a while, we actually had two versions of the Good Neighbor Authority in existence, both the Farm Bill version and a version that was uh, enabled through the appropriations um, uh, process. And the, they have different language. The permanent version is the Farm Bill version, uh, and that uses the term similar and complementary as concerns the work that needs to be done, uh, whereas the appropriations version used the term adjacency. Uh, and so this idea that good neighbor is inherently a cross boundary tool, uh, I think has um, taken a bit of a hit with similar and complementary, which the agency has interpreted to mean the nature of the work should be similar and complementary as opposed to physically geographically adjacent to a project that a state agency might be doing. Uh, so yeah, it's led to a little bit of confusion and, and I have uh, every once in a while heard rumor of potential lawsuits uh, that would come out uh, concerning this, but so far, uh, similar and complementary seems to be the interpretation of the day. Hmm. I think with that, I'll turn it over to Emery. Tyson, I have program revenue on one slide <laughs> um, and not on the other. Do you want to quickly go over program revenue? Oh, here, the, here it is. I must have just skipped over it. Sorry. Oh, perfect. No, I, I wondered where that had gone. Yeah. Um, so program revenue, uh, you know, this is obviously the, the carrot that brings a lot of states in on Good Neighbor. Uh, just to real broad strokes describe how all of that works. Uh, this is money that is wholly managed by the states. Uh, that was a change in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, but it does have to be used on Good Neighbor projects. Uh, so it can't simply be used for unrelated expenses. Uh, a state can't, uh, you know, pay for education through timber receipts. It does have to be tied to a Good Neighbor project. Uh, but it is transferable between good neighbor projects. Uh, so you could potentially see a timber sale on, you know, to use an Oregon focused example, uh, on say a west side forest with high timber value uh, and see those uh, revenues transferred to an east side forest for fire risk reduction uh, where work wouldn't otherwise pay for itself. Haven't seen a lot of that transfer, but it is at least uh, possible. Uh, and when it comes to the accounting of timber revenue, uh, we're seeing I would say a great degree of variability in the tracking systems. Uh, each state was really left uh, to figure out a system with their regional partners. There was no national direction on how that would work. Uh, and so um, I, I think Emory may go into a little more detail, uh, but uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty variable. Um, and what we're seeing generally is an emerging model uh, where you have modifications to an existing good neighbor agreement uh, that allows for a great degree of flexibility in how those, those dollars are used. Um, that makes it tricky for external partners because we can't just go look at a paper trail of uh, a given SPA, a supplementary uh, project agreement, and say, you know, project A happened and it generated X dollars. It's, it's really more that these have become pretty fluid accounting systems uh, with um, live spreadsheets that, that state and federal agencies are sharing. Uh, and so they're able to make decisions uh, pretty quickly in terms of where they want to direct those funds. Uh, and then a final point about uh, management of revenue, and this is a bit of a, a legislative snafu to changes being made at the same time in conference. And so I kind of suspect that we'll see this changed. At the moment, the language uh, specifically says that revenue is managed by a state. Uh, and so that excludes tribes and counties from selling timber. Uh, they could still be partners in laying out a sale or even potentially administering a sale, uh, but they wouldn't be using their contracting pathways and they wouldn't ultimately be managing the money unless they do so in partnership with the state. And with that cleanup, I guess now I will hand it over to uh, Emery to launch into details on the ground. Cool. Thanks, Tyson. Yeah, so I'm going to be going over, Tyson gave a great background of Good Neighbor Authority, and I'm going to be giving some background on what we found from our two rounds of interviews uh, with state and federal land managers really implementing good neighbor on the ground. So first wanted to go over a takeaway from uh, the 2018 round of research to produce that first um, good neighbor authority report. And one of the key findings was about enabling conditions. And as Tyson mentioned in the MOUs, um, fire, one of the key elements of these good neighbor authorities is having alignment on partner goals and fire risk reduction was ended up being a really important um, goal that partners appeared to agree upon in these 
good neighbor authority um, agreements. Another key enabling condition was infusion of funding from state, federal, or industry partners that um, kind of helped build state capacity, but then was often provided on the assumption that timber revenues from good neighbor authority commercial projects would help maintain that state capacity and would eventually replace the need for continued seed funding. So the takeaway from this is basically that if you aren't seeing more robust good neighbor authority in your state, activity in your state, it might be because one or more of these conditions is lacking. So moving on to, we also did a second round of interviews in the summer and fall of last year that was really delving into what does good neighbor authority look like now with a few more years under people's belts, as well as um, kind of the changes in the 2018 Farm Bill. And so we looked at types of projects that people were implementing under the authority and found that timber sales and prop work was really the most common activity that was, let's see, the majority of agreements in Idaho, Montana, Colorado, and Washington, and about half of agreements in Oregon. So definitely a big chunk of the work being done under the agreement, at least in the West. Um, we also heard a lot about fire risk reduction in terms of service work, as well as construction of aquatic organism passages, um, kind of invasive treatments, and then that road decommissioning construction or repair. Um, and often it was the case that service work was incorporated into revenue generating projects that were already happening. Um, and it's really just in the kind of right now, in fact, that we're seeing states starting to have program revenues come in and figuring out how to direct those revenues to standalone service projects versus wrapping service work into kind of commercial timber projects. Um, and Tyson touched on this earlier, but haven't seen a lot of um, act prescribed fire activity under the authority, though some states are looking at um, activities like pile burning in order to fulfill brush disposal requirements from those GNA timber sales. Um, so that's kind of what we've seen in terms of how people are using the authority. And then in terms of how these activities are being packaged, um, states are most often creating a master agreement with the Forest Service Regional Office and then using supplemental project agreements that encompass a kind of one avenue is a spa that encompasses a particular project with modifications done as a project advances or um, that master agreement with the regional office and then spas being signed with individual forests that encompass a broad range of activities and then modifications are made kind of as, as Tyson mentioned as projects and funding become available and we are seeing a trend toward writing those uh, spas pretty flexibly and broadly to reduce the need for modifications but then that goes back to kind of the complications with accountability of what's being done with what money, what percentage of service work, what percentage of commercial work, et cetera. Um, so if we're looking at this slide, it's we're generally seeing model three um, as a pretty pretty common way of doing things, especially in the Northwest. Emery, this is Heather. You've got a couple of questions in the chat. Do you want to wait till the end to take them? Uh, if you don't mind, I might, and then just rope Tyson into helping me answer them. Okay, that's fine, thanks. Okay, thanks, Heather. Um, okay, and last point I wanna to touch upon from our most recent uh, round of interviews was looking at collaborative aspects of Good Neighbor Authority. And really what we found is that when it comes to both um, revenue expenditure, as well as decision-making in terms of what types of projects to pursue under the authority, we found there really isn't a lot of space for kind of local uh, NGO entities, for example, um, that aren't that state or federal or, or county or tribal partner. Uh, only in Wyoming did we find that they had a formal process for 
including um, non-agency stakeholders such as counties, conservation districts, nonprofits in helping prioritize projects for the state to pursue under good neighbor authority. Um, though, though in several states, including uh, Utah, Washington, Oregon, they were pursuing, they said that the projects they were doing under good neighbor authority had kind of originated and been uh, prioritized by forest collaboratives or multi-stakeholder groups. So kind of an indirect connection um, between what collaboratives were, were desiring and what was actually pursued under good neighbor authority. Um, and then in terms of program, the expenditure of program revenues, again, not a lot of space for local, local partners that weren't the, the state or the federal agency, but in Oregon, um, Oregon Department of Forestry on a few projects had said that they were involving the Forest Collaborative and helping prioritize how to spend program revenues. So that could be a model potentially for opening up uh, that element of decision-making to more local stakeholders. Um, alrighty, I think I'm gonna go for a quick recap. Um, just kind of summing up what kind of the basics of good neighbor authority then, it's really not, according to what we found, not really a vehicle for collaborative implementation as stewardship authority is, for example, um, due to it really being that direct relationship between federal agencies and states, tribes, and counties. Some states are taking more of that authority approach where they're using good neighbor as a way to funnel forest service dollars to the state to implement a particular um, project, while others are really taking that more programmatic approach. They're um, developing GNA bureaus, hiring staff that are specifically focused on good neighbor projects. And the difference we found is largely dependent on whether states can put initial funding toward developing capacity to do these sorts of restoration projects, and whether there's potential for revenue generation that can then kind of support this pipeline of work in the longer term. Uh, that needs, leads to my next point kind of about capacity and the capacity needs on both sides. Um, for the state, we've really found the greatest expansion of the authority is in states that already have those large developed forestry programs and have the staffing and experience to take on this work. Um, and, and then on the Forest Service side, even though they're comp contracting out that implementation, we, we still found it's, um, there's a need for kind of project administration capacity as well as definitely capacity on the grants and agreements side. Um, so just something to keep in mind for, for Good Neighbor Authority projects, uh, those capacity needs on both sides. As Tyson mentioned, we have not seen a ton of cross-boundary usage with this authority, though several people that we interviewed have been interested in kind of looking at ways to use it across um, state and federal uh, lines. So we'll see where that goes in the future. And lastly, again, we've only seen a few projects where states and counties were using the authority. Uh, and given that they can't sell timber and retain those revenues, that might be a sign just that revenue generation is a pretty key aspect of this authority. And so we'll have to see in terms of what happens with um, tribal and county usage in the future if they, depending on their ability to retain program revenues. Um, so moving on to maybe looking at good neighbor in the context of other pathways for doing work on the forest. This is just a good way to think about Good Neighbor and uh, why Forest Service or other partners might be choosing one pathway over the other. So quick point before going into a, a few comparisons is just that for those of us who really wanna see more work done on the national forest, ideally Good Neighbor is additive in nature and doesn't have to displace other types of work. Um, thus far, our research wasn't able to make a firm determination on that, on whether Good Neighbor Authority was really expanding forest service capacity or whether it was really needing to divert some forest service capacity and attention, especially that of grants and agreement staff, um, away from other pathways of work. <clears throat> 
what we can say is it's probably likely to vary instance to instance based on uh, forest service and state capacity. Um, however, Good Neighbor also brings a unique set of incentives and some of those I'll go over in the following slides, but one that I want to cover right now is just that um, with Good Neighbor Authority, it's uh, especially when it comes to partnerships between um, federal agency and states, it's often um, might be a simpler relationship just because the Forest Service, for example, is partnering with a state agency that might be pretty similarly structured. Um, so that could just be kind of more compatible or, or easier agreement to work through. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And I'll go through then a few comparisons um, looking at Good Neighbor uh, as compared to stewardship contracts and agreements, for example. Um, key points to hit on here is just that Good Neighbor Authority or stewardship really requires um, collaboration through the life of the project due to um, agency direction on that authority. So gonna see more involvement of local interests and requirement that local interests and key stakeholders are involved in things like planning and desi design, the expenditures of retained receipts, implementation, monitoring, et cetera. And that's not a requirement of Good Neighbor Authority, which can potentially be, make things simpler um, when going through that sort of agreement. Um, stewardship also allows for best value contracting. So more than costs can be considered in those projects um, in, in the award of stewardship contracts, as well as the evaluation of technical proposals and stewardship agreements. Um, managers are need to be thinking about or, or can think about other aspects such as um, local community benefit, which can um, be an asset for the project. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but retained receipts is another kind of important difference potentially is just that, oh my gosh, we only have 15 minutes. Okay. Um, we, these retained receipts often require that collaborative process, whereas the expenditure of program revenues does not. And retained receipts might be a little bit less flexible than program revenue. Um, when it comes to cooperative participating and challenge cost share agreements, kind of key difference is that Good Neighbor um, does not require matching funds and these agreements do, which can kind of be um, go both ways when it comes to the simplicity of an agreement and the partner needing to come up with match. Um, no timber revenue, no revenue generation or timber removal means that these other agreements aren't based on that model of timber revenues being wrapped into and helping support service work. So that's something to keep in mind. And then they also are just available to a, a broader suite of non-governmental partners. Um, and lastly, when it comes to timber sales, uh, this is obviously the more traditional approach to commercial work um, and that both requires and supports in-house capacity. So it's supporting um, forest service jobs, but it's also uh, requiring more bandwidth from the agency to do some of this, do this commercial work. Um, and one thing that came up a lot in our interviews was that uh, timber sales generate trust funds and Good Neighbor Authority does not, even though they're required to still accomplish those required activities. So in terms of the administrative overhead required to operate those trust funds, that was maybe some, some low level concern we heard is just that uh, GNA projects, revenues from those projects aren't contributing to the administrative capacity of those trust funds. Um, Good Neighbor Authority also allows the use of state contracts, which can be simpler, so that um, might be a benefit for industry partners or, or the states in general, um, just using contracts that they're more familiar with. I'll breeze through these next slides, um, but just wanted to emphasize that RVCC does um, a lot of other work looking at all lands, different tools and authorities for all lands work and kind of how they're applied on the ground. One way that we look at that is through case studies of all lands projects. I have a few of them highlighted here. Um, and I don't want to pull out every single theme uh, that we found in those case studies, but one kind of key takeaway was the use of agreements um, in, in both prescribed fire and um, forest restoration focused all lands projects. 
And these agreements were really used for several key functions and I'll just kind of go through. They really provided a framework and legal foundation to for the partners to have that in place in order to take advantage of things like prescribed fire burn windows. Key for capacity building and especially kind of providing stability and long term partnership that helped in workforce development, uh, especially the development of prescribed fire burn crews. And then these agreements were also used um, to share resources and capacity and to work across boundaries, both allowing um, entities from different agencies to form one crew and for those crews to work across different land ownerships and different forests. So for more information on those, uh, kind of the way agreements were used in those sorts of scenarios and circumstances, uh, I definitely point to our case studies to provide more of those details. And kind of lastly, on all lands work, um, we, we know that these all lands projects require many different um, tools, authorities, uh, funding sources. And so I wanna point to our ideas to action guidebook um, which Heather, maybe you can, yeah, um, I, it looks like you're linking to some of these right now, but if you could provide the link to the ideas to action guidebook, that's another good one for, it sounds like we have an audience that's much more familiar with these sorts of tools, but if it's something that um, you'd like to share with your colleagues, this is a good primer on the different types of tools and authorities for doing all lands work, knowing that it often takes um, mixing and matching several of them in these sorts of projects. With that, oh, we have, I'll let Tyson take it over with a quick update on one of our other projects that has a lot to do with cross-boundary work and then we'll wrap things up. Yeah, thanks, Emery. So in the interest of time, we'll kind of gloss over this, but just to say, um, watch this space. Uh, RBCC is working on a TNC funded uh, natural climate solutions project specifically on lowering barriers to uh, community-based nonprofits to be uh, prescribed burn partners. Uh, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have some workshops and we'd love to see some of you folks at those and then uh, follow up reports as well. Great, and did you wanna um, go into our conclusion? Yeah, and then I think to, to leave time for questions, I'm not gonna dwell on these. I'll just, uh, we can just leave these up. I think we've touched on most of, uh, most of these issues. Um, but uh, you know, yeah, short version, I think we'll continue to see an emphasis on cross-boundary partnership. Uh, and I, I think the thing to flag is to watch the evolving nature of collaboration uh, under the new administration. Um, and I expect that we'll kind of see a tip in balance uh, potentially a bit away from states, but maybe less so in places where there's already been a major investment. Okay. And I will just leave you all with our website and just kind of the knowledge that we have a lot of resources on all lands work um, that should be useful um, for, yeah, kind of practitioners in this space. So with that, I think I can, I'll, I'll stop my screen share and